Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 134, Complaints. The other great New Order album title they never used. Yes, we're looking at complaints in the PhD space, so it's going to be a very dark and a very depressing uh, vlog this week. But I want to start with a story that happened to me, I think, 15 years ago, where one of the very, very few people I would actually refer to as a mentor in my life, the wonderful Graham Turner, said something that stayed with me as I was just about to deliver a keynote at the University of Queensland. So I was about to deliver a keynote, he was about to introduce me, and he just whispered something in my ear that I thought was incredibly funny sad but also remarkable and he said to me Tara the PhD is the only time in your life where you can complain and people have to listen to you people are paid to listen to you now th that's true and sad and funny but it is an interesting place I think to start our vlog this week because yes the PhD is a space where you as a student can complain and people like me, like your supervisor, like higher degree coordinators, we have to listen to you. And, you know, we try and solve problems for you. But let's go back a bit. And I'll just ask a provocative question at the start of this vlog. Are these complaints serving you? Yes, you can complain. But are those complaints enabling the completion of your PhD? And that's a question only you can answer. For supervisors, it is very, very challenging to supervise a student who complains a lot. Remember, we work, we work very, very hard to make sure that we can get a student through their candidature. And when you've got a student that every day, every week comes in and complains, it's a very arduous experience from a supervisory perspective because supervision, can be boring, it can be frustrating, and the relief that most of us feel when a student finishes is all-encompassing. Very, very often, in fact, mostly, when one of my students finish, I sit here or I go home, and sit in my big fabulous beanbag, and I actually have a bit of a cry. And those tears are a happiness, but they're also relief that it is over. So don't get me wrong, supervising PhD students is an absolute privilege. We are enabling the next generation of higher education. What a privilege that is. But many of us have had a few or many students who are difficult, who are troubled, who are nasty. And I'm using the word nasty intentionally. I had one student who used to come to every single meeting and abuse me from the beginning to the end, attack every single thing about me with the only intent to push me down and make me feel small. She gained a lot of pleasure from it and a lot of laughter from it. And of course, I never responded to the dreadful treatment. As I always say, you've heard me say it, supervisors are the grown up in the relationship, so I never reported the behavior. I never even commented on it. I just took it on the chin and focused on this student and completing her thesis. But can I say, it was the happiest day of my life when that student finished her PhD, uh, did the oral exam and passed with the corrections. And what was so amazing is when the corrections went through and after the oral exam, I said to her, please never contact me ever again. Our relationship is now over. I congratulate you on the thesis, but never contact me again. And what was remarkable is she was surprised by that that you know, all the abuse supposedly had an effect and she tried to contact me in the subsequent years and I never responded to those emails and she remained surprised. So I always remember how my stomach would drop, that dreadful churning in your stomach when I could hear her footsteps come down the corridor and move towards my office. So while we are talking about, importantly, complaints from PhD students to their supervisors today, I also want to make sure that the other side of this story is heard. So if you are enacting any of these behaviours with your supervisor, you can have a bit of a think, a bit of a pause, a bit of a regroup, and perhaps change that behaviour too. Because supervisors very rarely complain. We simply get on with 
the job. So yes, today is about complaints. It's a pretty sad, confronting and difficult environment in which to work. And therefore I've based our work today on a foundational document. I'm not talking about a vibe or an attitude or an opinion or stuff off blogs today. I'm going to use the complaints and the hierarchy of those complaints from a governmental document. So this is the Ombudsman New South Wales discussion paper, complaints about the supervision of postgraduate students. And this was released as its formal report in October 2017. So very current, very interesting. And can I say, I was a head of school uh, in New South Wales when that report was being prepared. So I actually recognise some of the cases discussed within it. So New South Wales is interesting. There are 10 universities in New South Wales and they're from all the different bits of the sector. So we've got the top end, we've got the bottom end, we've got regional universities, we've got universities of technology. So all the different types of universities are in New South Wales, which means that this material can be quite generalizable. So today I'm actually talking about complaints that have been reported, not assumptions, not urban myths, but complaints as exist formally in governmental reports. And what I'm then going to do, because I would argue, you know, they report the complaints very well in this document, but the recommendations that they discuss, I think, are, are pretty banal, to be frank with you. So to engage a way of changing this environment around the complaints. I'm going to use the international research which provides some better answers to these complaints I think. So let's get depressed. <laughs> let's go into complaints. So this is a challenging space and the reason it is a challenging space as we've talked about throughout every single vlog just about, supervision is based on assumptions and if a student comes to a supervision with particular expectations and assumptions and that's not shared or discussed with the supervisor who also has expectations and assumptions then you can see the nightmare that can befall us all. So the result of that type of dissonance, that disagreement is disquiet, anger, bitterness, resentment. And we also have to recognise that the relationship between a supervisor and a student is not an equal relationship. Yes, a supervisor must be caring and supportive and also honest. But there are times when we have to be brutally frank. There are points that I have to say to a student, if this remains in the thesis, you will fail. And often, and you know, I try and think about how I can improve my practice every single day. You know, I've had supervisory situations where every single week I've said, look, I really would change that or the next week, look, that's still there, that's a problem. And I've done that 10 times and the students never realised or changed it or done anything at all. And you know, by week 10, where we're about to submit the damn thing, I say to the student, look, I'm so sorry to be brutally frank on this, but that page is dreadful and it has to be removed today. If it stays in, the thesis will fail. And you don't want to use this type of language, you try to be subtle, but if a student is not picking up the seriousness of this situation, we have to be honest. Now, what happens when a supervisor does that, tells the truth, an honest, robust truth to help the student? Well, some students take it on the chin and they action that behaviour, they action that change. It also may be the basis of a change of supervisors. So students come into my office and say, right, my supervisor said this, game over, I need a new supervisor. So students change supervisors over this. And of course, it can be the basis of a bullying claim and also, of course, complaints to uh, organisations such as this. Now, these complaints may be true, but what I want to just tease out today for you if I can is thinking about it from a supervisor's perspective. If I can't convince you as a student about the importance of making these changes then you are going to go to examination and however brutal and nasty and frank that you think a supervisor is that will never prepare you for what will appear in an examiner's report. I remember I read probably 10, 15 examiner reports every single day, that's my job. And you know, you think a supervisor's tough, well prepare yourself 
to hear the unhearable, say the unsayable when you're reading some examiner's report. So however tough you think your supervisor is, they're doing it for a reason, I promise you, because examination is and must be tough and you never quite know what you're going to get through those examination reports. So how these feedback loops are taken by students is often the base of these complaints. So when a supervisor offers feedback, students complain in response to it. So let's now start with the complaints as listed in this report from students about supervisors. And we're going to start with the most serious complaints and go down the list. So the first one, which really did surprise me, to be frank, was supervisors, uh, sorry, students threatened suicide and supervisors and universities, it was argued, did not behave appropriately in response to that student's threatening of suicide. Who knew? Who knew? That's a huge area, it's a big area, and it's in this report. Now, that is a big area. I didn't know it was as common as it would be, but it is significant, and that's why organisations such as mine, the Office of Graduate Research, have a direct line to health, wellbeing, and counselling services at this university. So if a student appears in this office, in any, any of my staff at all, presents an issue, we immediately get on the phone, we organise counselling for that student, we make sure they're safe and protected, and they do not leave the office until a plan is in place, and we walk them, walk them to their next appointment. Okay, and every single one of my staff are schooled, are trained to care for students in that environment. Okay, but we're not professionals, our job is to connect them with professionals. Hear, listen, connect them with professionals. And people like me, deans in Australia right now, quite rightly, have to do mandatory suicide training, suicide prevention, how to enact what's often called sort of mental health first aid. Yeah. And that's all terribly important and crucial and it can save lives. But as a human, as much as a dean and professor and a supervisor, I always wonder if there's ever any single or correct response to a student making that declaration. And you know, it is coming from experience this. Colleagues of mine, mates of mine, have topped themselves, have killed themselves. And as we all do, uh, we look back on that situation and think, what could I have done? And I think about my two colleagues. There, there was not a sign that suicide was coming. And of course, you think about it, you go, did I miss the sign? Was there a sign and I miss it? And of course, you never actually know because there are many ways into a suicidal situation and there are many ways out of a suicidal situation. So this is a tough one, but all I know is officers like mine have to listen to a student, look at what's happening and have direct lines to professionals to create that suite of support. Okay, next degree of seriousness as reported uh, in this document was sexual harassment and racist conduct by supervisors. Now, of course, the wonderful Respect Now Always report was released. I think it was this time last year. So the report came from 2017. And it argued very strongly and talked about the responses to sexual assault and sexual harassment in Australian universities. And guidelines are just about to emerge within days about how going forward we apply this report and improve our practice quite rightly so, and we intend to, in the Office of Graduate Research at Flinders, disseminate this stuff widely. We are part of this conversation and we intend to be engaging with you to ensure we are best national practice. Full stop. Deal breaker. Now, racism, I hope, is our next national conversation. You've heard me talk a lot about decolonising the doctorate. That's an incredibly important project to me. And if we take the decolonisation of the doctorate seriously, then it changes absolutely everything we do in doctoral education. So let's hope that's the next one and we understand clearly what decolonisation means in teaching and learning more generally and also in postgraduate education. Now, in the hierarchy of complaints, we're now moving through to 
and this is a fascinating one, wow, allegations that supervisors destroyed materials, sabotaged research, or plagiarised student work. To be frank with you, I thought this one would be a bit higher up on the hierarchy. I would get probably 10 emails a week, every single week, from students around the world complaining about this matter. So clearly this is a thing. Right. Now it is a thing, but I don't know whether it's right or wrong or in the middle. But I know it is a thing. Now in Australia we are privileged, we are lucky because we have an Australian code of conduct for research and this is fantastic. It's detailed, it's important, I teach it in supervisory training. So when supervisors are about to start supervising at Flinders University, I run core sessions and key components of those core sessions are the Australian Code of Conduct for Research. So it is everything, it is the start of what we do, it is everything that we do. So it is important, we do teach it, is it an issue? Absolutely, are there ways to handle it? Absolutely. But again, and just to put the caveat in place there, it does operate the other way too. Maybe this is you know, disciplinary specific, if you will, but in my fields of humanities and social sciences, of course, I try and write with students. But can I also make the point that students think they're making a bigger contribution to a piece than they are? I always give authorship. So if a student has had any role in an article, I give them authorship, anything at all. But just to give you two examples, in two particular books that I've written, uh, I gave a student a third authorship in the first book, they contributed a thousand words to a book, one thousand words to an entire book, which I ended up rewriting because it had no references, but I still gave the student authorship, and in a recent case, a student produced you know, about, say, four or five thousand words in a book. The referees picked that up as the weakest component of the book. It had to be radically rewritten and transformed. I still gave the student authorship, but their role was very, very reduced. So I just ask for you as a student, do think carefully about authorship. You absolutely have rights, and supervisors like me will always include you. But just remember, your role may not be as large or significant as you think it is because in some fields you are a student so your work is here and that's great but in some theoretical fields the international research is up here and so it's of a higher order so we as supervisors have to lift that work radically before it can pass refereeing so just be aware of that. There's also a really complicated series of complaints in this document about tone and this is a hard one. The ways of communicating between a student and a supervisor. So the idea that a supervisor can offer a comment about research, the student becomes inflamed and then an adversarial relationship is in place simply from that feedback. So the relationship falls apart very, very quickly. It cascades to absolute decline. I've seen that on many, many occasions. So this then starts to escalate in a legally very concerning way where either the student or the supervisor starts to bad mouth the other party in email or indeed through gossip. Now I think a lot of these issues between students and supervisors can be solved at the start by an honest, clear and robust conversation about what this situation is going to be like and particularly talking about how uh, both parties will communicate with each other. So I always demand, and I don't put up with anything else, I demand a clarity, respectfulness, kindness in all email communication, in all conversations in this office, kindness, decency, integrity, respect. That early case, actually it's not that early, it's about 10 years ago, that early case I talked about that student abusing me week after week, I don't put up with that anymore. I don't put up with that anymore, life's too short. So I demand civility, and if a student can't reach those levels of civility, they need to find themselves another supervisor. I've never had to go to that point, because at the start I say, this is how we are going to communicate. And also remember, cultural safety is everything. So if you are experiencing racism, sexism, homophobia, xenophobia of any kind, then that is not good enough. That's not reasonable. You need to come to either me as the Dean of Graduate Research or your international equivalent and address that matter. That is not good enough. That is a deal breaker. Now, the next bit of this vlog, 
reverses it. So we look at the complaints as reported here from supervisors about students. How fascinating. Now these are odd. These are unusual and they were a complete surprise to me as I was preparing this session for you today. So remember, these are the formal complaints, the ones that have actually bubbled to the surface. As I've said, supervisors tend to accept a fair amount before it goes completely bonkers. We just quietly get the student through and put up with a fair amount of staff. But these are really divergent complaints that come from supervisors about students. Now, firstly, this is an interesting one. Wow. Students illegally record the discussions with their supervisors. So the proliferation of smartphones has clearly created this behaviour. So, of course, this is illegal. You, you, can, you can't just record somebody. It is illegal. So the privacy of supervisors are lost. You might want to record, ask your supervisor, can I record this session? And then they go, yes, most of us will go, yes, and you can record it. But if you do it illegally, and that's what it is, if you're doing it illegally, uh, expect some issues to emerge even with the police. And can I say, this has actually happened to me as dean. So this also is a thing. Uh, I saw a student sit right there and uh, turn on their mobile phone recorder, like I, like I don't know about recording and stuff. Like, just a reminder, I was a professor of media and a professor of communication and I teach smartphones, so like, guys, come on. So I saw her doing it, so I just paused for a moment, went and got one of my professional colleagues, uh, sat him down and said, right, well, I've just seen you uh, switch on your mobile phone to record this conversation. Uh, my colleague here uh, will now log that you've done that, which is, of course, illegal. Now, could you explain to us, before we get into a meeting, why you have switched that recorder on today and how you think we should handle the situation now? Boom. The second area of complaint from supervisors about students is the threatening or stalking behaviour by students. And sometimes this does lead to restraining orders. Now, I've certainly experienced that as well. Students wait next to my car to talk with me at the conclusion of a work day in the UK, because I didn't have a car, we didn't drive. Uh, I would be blocked, physically blocked, from going about my business to get on the train to get home. So I would actually be physically blocked from walking up to the train station. And also, of course, students sending desperately frightening emails. Now, why does this happen? And again, this is, I think, about assumptions in the supervisory space. Because there is an assumption in that supervisory relationship of intimacy. Now, it is an intimacy, it is a closeness, but it's not an intimacy or closeness on personal terms. Important. This is a professional relationship, full stop. And by the research, this is a pretty common situation here that what happens is students become dissatisfied with the professional relationship, the boundaries that exist around that professional relationship, and they want more and they start to bend the lines. And it becomes frightening for a supervisor. Absolutely, truly frightening. I cannot tell you how frightening this can be. Now, I've always kept the lines very, very clear. Students never visit my home. No one knows my home address. That's how serious I take this. So students do not know my home address. Students do not even have my mobile phone number. Only my parents have my mobile phone number. No one else in the world has it. So these sorts of structural separations, so via physicality and location, my house, and also via technology, this stuff is incredibly important. And they re render the relationship really clear. They can't call me because they don't know my number. They can't visit my house because they don't know where it is. But the moment that a student visits our house, or sends us a text message, then it opens a door that should not be open. And again, one final example I will give you on this about how serious this can be is, obviously this is my workplace. I come here every day, I am paid to work here. So this is my office, this is where I sort of live in my working environment. And students come in here. And just to give you a sense of what happened, even in this job, a young man came into my office and started to threaten it was very, very frightening, very aggressive, very intimidating, moving towards me, saying the unsayable. And then when he was frightening me, uh, he was laughing at frightening me. So what happened from that point, 
and it's right here actually, I install the panic button and all of my staff have a panic button right there. So it's a terrible situation. I don't matter too much, but my staff do matter and I have a duty of care over my staff as well to look after them. So just a reminder that you know students, if you can, try and keep control of yourself because obviously you know, I'm a five foot two woman. This was a six foot two bloke, a young man, and he frightened the hell out of me. And you know, panic, panic buttons have been put in place so it doesn't happen again. So just be mindful of your discourse with others because it can be intimidating. Now, the New South Wales Ombudsman Report recommended a series of strategies to handle all these complaints both ways, from supervisors and from students. So that includes counselling, the appointment of new supervisors, also some sort of mediation structure, training processes for supervisors, and also when a problem emerges, address it early rather than allowing it to fester. Now, my response to that was like, duh, well, obviously, yeah. Uh, so I think the report diagnosed what was going on incredibly well and listed those, but didn't really provide what I would argue are concrete strategies to manage it, pretty basic stuff. And there are some greater resources I think we can use in terms of managing the advice to students and supervisors in these difficult situations. So Herman Lellyvelt, really worked through what good communication means for students and supervisors. So I think that's really significant. We talk about communication skills, what actually is that and how does that operate in doctoral education. So Herman provided a great way through that. He stresses, and I completely agree with this, the damaging nature of gossip student to supervisor, supervisor to student with colleagues. Gossip is incredibly debilitating because supervisors are human just like students are human. And supervisors are here to help students. But I think part of our problem is we don't really put content around the word help. What does help mean? So what is the role of the student and the supervisor? And of course, it's heavily negotiated in this space. A lot of supervisors are what I call, and what the literature calls, particularly in Europe, light touch supervisors light touch supervisors. So they use the line a lot, well it's your thesis. So you go, oh, da, 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 and it, well it's your thesis, what do you think? It's your thesis, what do you think? So that's light touch supervision. And that's great if that's what you want. So a lot of students just want to get on with it, fantastic, that's brilliant, then light touch supervision suits you. But if you want an immersive environment and your supervisor is a light touch supervisor, you can see the conflict. So at the beginning, make sure you're both facing the table and you agree on the rules and the parameters. Therefore, making sure that supervisors and students share communication styles and rules, that's incredibly important. And think through, the boundaries of the professional relationship and what that professional relationship actually means and be very clear about the parameters of that for supervisors and for students. And then I think from those basic guidelines, some of these complaints, most of these complaints, uh, no longer exist. Now this is a tough space. The longer a PhD candidature goes, the more likely the relationship is to rub. And that's why I focus very strongly on a professional relationship for a finite period and then students move on with their lives. The longer it goes, the more the rubbing takes place. And remember, supervisors have one goal. You had one job, we have one goal, and that is to create an outstanding thesis that moves through examination with ease. That's what we're trying to do here. But it begins and it ends with overtly expressed expectations. Professional frameworks are in place to manage those negotiations and also strong communication skills and rules about verbal communication, also about email and how that supervisory relationship is to be discussed with others. A difficult, dangerous space, but I hope you've enjoyed it and as always, I wish you love, light and peace. Tia.